welcome everybody. Hello. First off, I want to say props to Angela for coming up with the idea for this. And I love Maker Faire so much. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad they get a virtual one because I miss you too. And you haven't met Nova in person. No. Um, I really want to though. So Angela, Nova, Jay, you've got your sweet goggles. And is that a version of Dexter? Whoa. <laughs> 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 I thought I was camera shy. He, he's okay. And, oh, yeah. And you've got a bunch of your other companions on your wall behind you, too. Yeah, I have an army. So then I've got Archimedes and Fenrir, who's like my new one. Archimedes mm -hmm. I first built a couple of years ago for, actually, each of these are made for a Maker Faire. Like, the first version was for Maker Faire 2018, then this was for last year, and this is for this year. <laughs> I just build robots constantly. I don't, I don't stop. <laughs> I have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> I have a slight problem. It's fine. <laughs> well, how did you get inspired to like build them in the first place? You. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, you're clearly inspired by Star Wars and stuff. I don't know. Oh yeah. Um, you remember my first one was uh, a giant spider named Aussie, and that one, I got an idea from the Spider Verse because I saw how Penny Parker, the female mm. Spider Man, not the um, cool Gwen dancing one, but the robot one, I noticed how the LEDs on the sphere moved around. And I was like, oh, that's perfect. And then I just started working from that. Oh, um, yeah. Angela, what about you? Uh, I was inspired by both of you. So thanks oh. for setting me on my robot journey. Um, I had so much fun meeting Dexter at a Hackaday Supercon in November. Um, and Jay and I actually had a little brainstorm about what kind of bot I could build, and that's where Nova was born. No way! Um, cool. Mine was inspired by, uh, actually just, so, hmm, probably by my nickname, where, uh, my nickname is Merlin, and Merlin had, uh, the wizard had a, an owl familiar called Archimedes, but also just by, like, trying to build something with this Google AIY vision kit back in the day. And he's sort of swapped brains around a few times since then. This one's back to being AI again, using like the open Vino system with a Raspberry Pi camera here and a Movidia, an Intel neural compute stick too. But um, Mohib was the one who said, like, it was like super late the night before Maker Faire. And I was like, ah, trying to like get it to balance on a box or whatever so I could give out stickers. And Mohib was like, you're gonna put it, that on your shoulder, right? And I was like, ah, like obviously, of course. And I hadn't even thought about it before then, but it, it had been an idea that I had to build a familiar robot. And I never like did it until I accidentally did it while trying to do something else. So like it was total coincidence. Man, well he for the win. <laughs> yeah, that guy's awesome. Uh yeah. Someone was asking about materials bias. Right. Why don't y'all answer that? All right, that, that actually is on our material bias. Uh, I am material bias. I like 3D printing. I draw and CAD everything. So I always go to 3D printing first and foremost before going to like other stuff, mm. which is like my material bias. Uh, this was a good discussion we had. We had a little uh, chat with other bot builders. Uh, was it last week? All time has stopped like that. having me. <laughs> um, and one of the things with Nova is that um, I would have loved to have 3D printed her, but I don't own a 3D printer. Um, and I had a very brief two-week window where I was borrowing my partner's 3D printer while he was on vacation. <laughs> I did all of the guts uh, and tried to get that as as polished as I could and then relied on my other skills, which are uh, sewing and sculpting to finish her off. And I actually really like how that ended up working. Like, I don't think she would have been as compelling if she was a completely 3D dragon. Um, so she's very cozy and bird-like and friendly. And people call her uh, like Falcor from NeverEnding Story. She's got a little bit of that vibe. So yeah, I definitely uh, lean towards the soft, uh, Squishy, yeah, cuddly stuff. And for a wearable, that makes so much sense. I had kind of the same thing going on, actually. So Archimedes is all 3D printed um, with some like extra embellishments made of like CDs and stuff. But for this one, I was trying to build a robot in quarantine. And I don't have like, I have a tiny, terrible 3D printer here that's really slow and could not do something like this, let alone this big. And so I had like one day or two days in the office because no one else is there. 
but I like I can't go there all the time so I was like I got to do something fast so I'm like laser cutter this time and um I thought that cardboard would get be a good prototyping material but um Christine Suna recommended using like foam core which I think would be rad mm -hmm. but especially like right now while it's I'm still prototyping it's kind of nice to have the cardboard be bendy and flexy and stuff so I can sort of like really plan it out and smush it around then go back and laser cut some more parts really quickly and then once I've finalized the design it would be cool to make it out of something a little bit more permanent like basswood or foam core or whatever. Yeah speed is always a problem when it comes to 3D printing but it's okay one day. Yeah. 3D printing is on the way. Don't you have like three, three, three printers, uh, Jay? Okay, I have four printers, mm. and that is not a problem. I just have an issue. <laughs> You're a collector. I think yeah, it's building way more about. faster when you have like three printers going. But the problem mm. is, is like it gets so hot, and then like oh. if the power goes out, that's like a good day of work gone. Mm -hmm. So like it has it has its drawbacks. This is definitely has a drawback, especially because since you know 3D printing is plastic, and after I'm finished doing some other stuff, I want to rebuild my dragon robot, and it has oh, to yeah. be fire. So I have to find a better material to actually other coat the 3D printing process into some type of metal, or actually use metal forging type of techniques, so I can build a dragon head. That way, the head doesn't melt when the fire comes out. Mm -hmm. So. You know about Shapeways, right? Where you can get things printed in metal, but it's kind of slow and expensive. Yeah, see, that's the problem is the expensive part. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Another thing I like perfect. about cardboard is I'm trying to do more stuff with recycling. And so like I've been trying to incorporate recycled plastic materials into mm -hmm. it while I'm fixing Archimedes as he inevitably breaks again and again and again. <laughs> and uh, this I can just like, it's recycled. Like this is a Cheeto carton that I got from the office and it's just like it's made from whatever and then like I feel good because these are kind of throwaway pieces in the end and uh they're made of stuff that was going to be thrown away anyway so they get an extra life yeah I see some of the chat questions here and oh yeah it says uh I thought about lost PLA for casting oh. on my dragon not yet that's a good idea I'm actually going to write that down here myself because that is clever and genius and thank you yeah so Archimedes right now, the, this version does not have AI in it. I switched away from that because um, part of my other whole thing with using AI in robots is that I think we have to be really careful and thoughtful about how we use AI because it can be used in some malicious ways. Even if you put it in a cute, adorable frame, uh, it can be used to do some scary stuff. And part of the point with Fenrir, so this one doesn't have any AI. What I'm coming back to, this is version two. The original one did, and it would like try and detect people's emotions and respond to those. So this one is gonna have AI again. Uh, right now he's set up to detect faces. And what I do with that is that I can test different ways of defeating facial recognition AI. So, uh, mm. you know, it's basically a way of subverting the medium, like using AI to try and learn how to uh, defeat AI, uh, which I think is, for me, that's really fascinating. And I think that it's, you know, uh, a thoughtful way of approaching it. Alex, when you start the cyberpunk future, you know, just let me know. Like, give me a call first. Dude, we are in the cyberpunk future. <laughs> I mean, we could get into that, but... <laughs> okay, let's see what's our, yes. our talking points. Uh, microcontroller choices. Angela, what is your beautiful dragon using? Mm. So, Nova is actually using an Adafruit Feather, um, and it's one of the... Um, the radio one, she doesn't have any radio features right now, um, but the goal with Nova uh, was that she would connect to a wirelessly controlled fairy costume that I have, um, that I wear around sometimes. Uh, it was a little bit too much to put on <laughs> for this live stream, um, but that actually has a magic wand that changes the colors of the costume, and it broadcasts the color out to whatever accessories they're listening in. Um, so I thought Nova would be a great little companion to that piece, and then she could light up uh, with that costume. Um, but other than that, you know, it's just using um, Arduino uh, for programming and kind of using the features of that board. It's also a really nice shape to get into her because I know uh, Dexter is having this issue. It's like he has outgrown <laughs> <laughs> being a shoulder bot. Yeah, uh, <laughs> he's a big boy now. Like he has grown up, um, and as they get bigger and bigger, it's harder to shove all this hardware in there and still have them be comfortable to wear. Uh, and so I like the little like, compact size that uh, that had. 
yeah. and she's actually pretty lightweight. Uh, which is Angela, nice. your the feather seems so appropriate for that design, like just the name of it. But also, your your dress is so magical. I hope that people look that up because yeah. it it change like you said, it changes color based on this magic wand thing, and it's so cool. Yeah, I remember having so much fun with that. And I have a lot of cosplayer friends, so I was just like bragging <laughs> about how <laughs> it's like a busy person who made this really cool like light up dress that's still like light. And I also remember at Supercon, we had fun because you gave us your wands and we were just running around like changing your dress colors. Very interactive. <laughs> it's a very fun thing to do. So we have two questions that are kind of related. Someone asked, how do you decide on which little movements the companions make when they're resting? And someone else saying, what aspects of your projects have you done to give your companions personality? And I feel like those two are really connected. Mm -hmm. Like for me, uh, this guy is going to have his ears they're set the, on servos on an angle so they'll be able to sort of do this, like a sad puppy, or like this, like an excited puppy. And like, that'll give him a lot of personality where this guy is just kind of like doing random little movements to make him look like he's doing something. Mm -hmm. But I'd really like him to, to actually be able to look at stuff. Right what brains are they using, both of them? This guy has a Raspberry Pi using um, the Neural Compute Stick 2 to do with OpenVINO to do AI stuff. But right now, uh, I'm going to be, I've got a re-speaker 2 mic Pi hat on top of it, which is has a couple of microphones, so I'll be able to speak to it. It's got a speaker that comes out, so it'll be able to talk uh, and like tell me things. I'm going to um, use its AI uh, text detection to, or speech detection, to transcribe my dreams. So I'll just be able to tell him my dreams. He can hook onto my shoulder, but also my computer, so he can like stare at me throughout the day. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, well, and then this one is just running on a couple of Arduinos. Oh, what okay. about y'all? You've got Feather on Nova. What's inside oh, Dexter? Right. Dexter is running a pro trinket for his basic movements, uh, which is going back on for his movements. Uh, his ears move, and then his head can go, you know, back and forth, and he also look around, too. Um, those movements, I decided because he's, of course, a monkey, and I was trying to think of a curious monkey design. So the best thing I could think of, because I was originally going to make him, like, look up and down, but it made him look like he was nodding yes or no, which is just not what I was going for. So I figured out making him go like this and go like this is a lot more entertaining. But um, he's using a pro trinket for those movements, and he also has his wave feature using a PIR, a PIR sensor. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. His what um, feature? A wave feature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he has a wave feature um, using an Adafruit, uh, no, Arduino, sorry, using an Arduino Nano controller and a PR sensor. That way, when um, people walk by, you can actually give a small wave. So I can actually show that. Yeah. Activate, because I have to put it back. So, as he. Does stuff like that, so. Uh -huh. That's so cool. Yeah. Angela, yeah, what about cool. you? How do you like give personality to Nova? Well, I actually had a similar problem that Jay was working through. It's like, what's the right head motion that doesn't just look like an, mm, I'm just nodding and like I'm bopping around. Um, and Nova ended up starting as a dragon and sort of turned very bird-like as I was sculpting her face. So she's got this bird head tilt that makes it look like she's scanning the room and it's just kind of randomized and it has some thresholds for like um, not going too far around because it gets very strange or her head will turn all the way upside down. Mm. <laughs> I can read uh, to calibrate for that too. Yeah. Um, it's gonna have this little sort of dog-like head tilt too. But it makes so much sense because birds are dinosaurs and it's <laughs> like dragons. That is true, birds are dinosaurs. And then her wing motion is kind of um, inspired by a resting butterfly because oh. she does go with my butterfly fairy dress. Um, and then I haven't shown off her other feature yet. This is a GD. GD. Oh. So then she has a little, what I call in my code, happy flap function. <laughs> <laughs> so she reacts and gets a little bit more excited when somebody um, interacts with her. And other than that, she's just kind of scanning and observing uh, and inviting people to come uh, see what she's all about. Yay, interactions! <laughs> it's amazing how delicate she is. It seems like making a robot seem delicate is probably a huge challenge. Well, this yeah. is funny thing, because our next talking point, which I'm going to skip, I guess if you don't mind, uh, building for wearability. That's mm. where things got interesting. And since we're going with Angela, I'm going to ask you first, because I love how you're just like a scarf. <laughs> You just kind of just love that feature of your uh, robot, but like... Oh yeah, it also covers up some of the gnarlier aspects of it. Yeah. <laughs> 
So what are some of your design aspects when you guys are like designing for wearability? Well, our community started out with this like wraparound uh, harness that was made with this structural armature wire um, inside of a bike inner tube <laughs> that would basically just wrap around my torso so that it was stabilized. But it also took a bunch of time to put on and like his head wasn't super secure so it would like fall off while I was putting it on. Like being able to put it on and take it off is a huge aspect of the wearability for me. Um, and this harness finally is the one that feels like comfortable and I can forget that I'm wearing it because it's a it's like an athletic harness that's got some uh, Velcro here like that straps around and uh, this other thing that like provide some strain relief for the cables and goes around my arm and it just feels really stable. Not only that, but the attachment here, it's like a GoPro base so you can switch out different robots on it if you want, but also it's got these little grooves here and elastic bands that are super tight on those grooves so that the base is super stable. And when I had it just like a piece of wire in some rubber wrapped around a metal bracket that was not optimal and it was also very uncomfortable. Lots of yeah, time I needed. <laughs> I remember we were talking about that like last year at Maker Fair after we were like done wearing our robots for the day. We we're just like, oh, our shoulder, oh, no. things just hurt. Yeah. So like having it be more comfortable is brilliant. Just genius idea. You struggled with that with Dexter. Yeah, Dexter, this is a trust anyone who's been following you um, should know. If you're not following me, you should. Uh, <laughs> this is Dexter V4. Dexter has been growing up as I keep coming up with new ideas and I keep redesigning him, but the problem with that is that he keeps getting bigger. Mm -hmm. So originally, he was supposed to sit on my shoulder, but that didn't work. So he ended up sitting like on my back shoulder, kind of like how um, Fenrir, or I'm not sure if that's saying your robot's name right. Fenrir, oh, what now? Your oh, Fenrir. Fenrir. Yeah. Kind of like how Fenrir was sitting, but just using a backpack strap. But um, I kept upgrading and evolving to a point now where I'm actually customizing a backpack. That way he can sit on top of the backpack when he's out. And then I can also easily take him off and take him down for people to mess with. Because uh, one thing about this version of Dexter, which I like, is that I won't have to also be the puppeteer with him. I can literally just mm -hmm. take him down, sit on a table somewhere. And I can go off and do something else. And he can just sit there, wave at people, and you know, interact type of situation. Something I've been really trying to go for. But I'm also working on a few other little more wearable projects that will fit on my shoulder again. So we'll see. Yours is also brilliant because your backpack serves as a place you can put Dexter at the end of like a maker fair. Yeah. Whereas I would always have to like I would just cram Archimedes in <laughs> whatever bag I had with me. <laughs> He's like been through lots of travel scenarios that are super not friendly and like you you seem to have that solved that from day one yeah i'm thinking about that already because i know once um the world goes back to normal i plan to leave like i've already told my job like i am going to be heading out as soon as everything calms down i need to travel so me customizing this backpack is perfect because i'm going to take dexter with me and we're just going to have fun we're just going to go places take pictures and just have a good time good. Angela, Tanya just asked a question that says, do you think a squishy robot is an advantage for shoulder ache then? And it seems like your yes. yours is optimized. Plus she's really light, you said. Yeah, so what? So I learned a little bit from watching both of you build your bots and having the challenge of the harness. Um, and I thought I was like trying to design my own harness to hold her steady. And actually, because I didn't really cram a lot of hardware in her and she's so light, she doesn't need a harness, she just drapes which was like the last minute discovery about 30 minutes before I brought her out for the first time. It's actually a little elastic here to kind of keep her there. And then she's just perched and I don't have to um, like keep her on there, like the counterbalance of her tail and actually her battery pack is in the oh, deal cool. too. Oh, that's um, so that helps a little bit with the balance. Um, and then what was really interesting that um, is it, I don't think you can do, well, maybe, uh, Dexter at this point, you could probably give him to somebody else to wear. Um, because I, it's so easy to get Nova off. I actually have gone out and given her to people to wear at a party. We can just like sit her on other people that. to try, um, which has been really fun. And I think, uh, a good thing to think about when you're prototyping is like, do you want it to just be your companion or do you want to share your companion with someone else to make it easy for them to like cuddle or interact yeah. with. Um, well, so I wanna think about that some more too. 
That was definitely um, what I thought about with Dexter was to make him more interactable because originally he would just sit on me and people have to like go walk behind me and interact with him. Mm-hmm. That's something I definitely like worked on changing for him and that's why I have like a personal backpack where I can take him off that way I could just be like, oh, you want to see him? Here, there you go. <laughs> I was working on one that had a separate controller and then I'd be able to hand that controller to a child or something because children always love interacting <laughs> with these. And that yeah, would be like my, a great way to... Okay. One of my biggest problems when I used to go out with Dexter and um, I actually went recently, well, I'm taking recently, last year. Or was it this year? Time. Um, <laughs> Barb to, um, it was a design con. And one of the things that ended up happening was this little girl wanted to see Dexter. And I had to like kneel down and like pretty much, you know, get on my knee for her to like interact and just like touch him a bit. kind of great too. Yeah, in just, own way. it's it's such a bother though. Like I'm old, I got old man. <laughs> <laughs> You're like 27. Shut up, old man. He's okay. We doing that no more. <laughs> uh, we got some interesting questions here in our chat. Yeah, I know. Um, any chances of an open framework for a like feature? I think we're all working on that, honestly. Mm-hmm. Like I think there will yeah. end up being a few. Uh, I haven't really worked on anything like that. Like I. Of course, I'm all open source, so like everything I build, even like these crazy goggles, will eventually be open source public. Y'all can go crazy and do whatever because I am a big facilitator of learning. Like I, not a good teacher, but if I can show you what I do and you learn from that, great. But um, a basic framework, I feel like, would be a little bit too much Lego. Like you know how you can get like a Lego body and they all fit the same way, no matter what you do. And one thing I like about um, these type of familiars is that it can be personalized and customized to like whatever type of animal or robot that you want to make so i don't think i'll be doing any like special well, i'm working on it I'm working on i it. am too um it's brought up a lot of like everyone's like how do i build it you must be so advanced and it's like nah i'm just kind of tinkering i think we're all kind of tinkering with the skills that we have um and so trying to do a best practices of the challenges that we've all kind of collaboratively worked on like the wearability and um, we haven't really talked too much about servos but like trying to manage all these servos that are making our bots move would be a good thing to release our findings out into the community so people can build upon that uh, and I've actually been thinking about this a lot with kids so I work in a makerspace that has a lot of kids there and I actually build Nova partially there um, and it's a really great thing to think about for like a kids or teens program to build your own bot. Um, and in that case, you have to have some sort of structure or framework to really get everybody to think about what are the components that make something feel alive and feel like a fr- little robot friend. So I think that could yeah. be cool to get some other people involved in and see where we could go with that. I like the idea of there being little like families or types of them. Mm-hmm. I think there's room for multiple ones. Let's see. Uh, maybe. Let's see. What else questions do we have? I'm trying to get as many questions as we can because I'm trying to also help with this. Um, yeah. How do we deal with CPU heat and dissipation from such a small factor? Oh, that's easy. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I am insane. This, like, like <laughs> a sleeve that's like uh, just a fabric sleeve. The torso is made of folded cardboard and then it's open on the top. And that enables me to easily like mess with the stuff that's inside, but also it leaves an avenue open for heat dissipation. So that's just how I feel like a feather doesn't generate much heat, does it? No, uh, no, but I know she'll get toasty if I wear her for like three to four hours at a time, but generally I don't. Um, and, and like you were saying, Alex, there are some ways that you can cheat with fabric covers so that it's um, got some breathability without looking like it's a transparent object so there's some cool stuff you can do with that um well, here's a fun question for like alex this is really for you can any of your contraptions do anything in the way of telepresence oh yeah you know i love that um so telepresence is a huge pet uh thing of mine that I, i've been trying to like popularize it for a while archimedes's future is as a telepresence robot so i've got this thing called the stereo pie which is a raspberry pi based stereo camera module it's got two eyes and it's comes in with this spacer so that you can space it like human eyes and i've got a tutorial on how to use that uh that maybe i'll post in the chat afterwards but um yeah i want to mount them inside of a little owl guy and then i'll be able to send him to events in place of myself and he'll just represent me uh and using this service called remo.tv which is for telepresence robots you can go on this site right now today 
go to remo.tv, you can browse around, find a robot that's online, and you can control it through your browser and see through its eyes. So I want to combine these two things, basically Remo bots and Archimedes, and make a telepresence avatar for myself that I can send places. Or send that sounds them. super cool, but at the same time, I just imagine like a villain version of that. Like, you know, like, oh, I finally caught the villain. <laughs> it's actually an owl that turns around. He's <laughs> cool. I mean, I'm not against villainy. Like, <laughs> You're, you're clearly the superhero here. <laughs> you need a nemesis. <laughs> Angela, you already got your ne I feel like you and Nick have could have a like hero nemesis vibe if you wanted. Yeah, I mean, I had a I had a grand plan that our bots would somehow interact and like be um, related in some way. But, you know, I kind of took Nova in the direction that she wanted to go. She's very glam uh, mm. and very tuned into my fairy. Uh, personality <laughs> okay uh that's a good uh segue into our next uh talking point uh not engineers using arts and skills um as some of you probably know or don't know i'm not an engineer i went to art school i have a degree in illustration i barely use that piece of paper in the closet right now <laughs> Um, Angela, you're also an art student, aren't you? Yes, I am. Yeah, I came to uh, hardware through the art lens, through making interactive clothing and uh, installations. So yeah, I'm not trained. Uh, I just figured it out, as I think we all kind of did, um, and used a lot of really great open source resources on our journey. Yeah. What about you, Alex? Aren't you? I forgot what major you were. <laughs> I, studied, I, I studied languages. I majored in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got into hacker spaces um, after college, and I'd been in first robotics as a teenager, but um, yeah, it was really just through the hacker spaces that I learned about Arduino and like all this other stuff. Um, and now I mostly learn on the internet while I'm trying to build a specific project. I'll just keep learning by finding tutorials and stuff, and that's great because my job is to make tutorials and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty much how I, I learned. Everything I learned is from the internet and trial and error. I kid you not, no matter who you are watching this in the future, past, present, times, relative, failure is going to be your best friend. The first time I made a servo move, I blew it up. I got uh, yeah, wait, that's impressive. <laughs> yeah, I, I had bought a huge power supply because I didn't know how, you know, Ohm's Law worked or anything like that. So I ended up uh, attaching a very small mini micro servo and powering it directly with a 12 AA battery pack. <laughs> instantly just poof to smoke and then start smoking. You know, just like, oh, alarm went off. I can off. see your face when you did that. <laughs> <laughs> my roommate kind of freaked out a bit, but like, I, that was my beginning. That was the first time I had interaction with servos. And it's been the same way since. Like, I still mess up and have like accidents constantly. I'm just more safe about it. <laughs> So we're nearly out of time here. I wonder if we should each drop links uh, in case people haven't seen the description to our projects in the chat and then we can like wrap up. Maybe someone wants to choose a final question. Um, we can do final questions. Also, we can keep going as long as we want. It's just that like the schedule yeah. says this ends at 3.30. I mean, I vote we should try going until, you know, I guess maybe an extra 30 minutes when we when, when try pushing it, guys. Come on, no. Oh. Maybe we'll like just get bored of each other. I kind of <laughs> doubt it. Oh, <laughs> uh, David says keep going, so we're just gonna keep oh, going. Yeah, yeah, we'll keep we're, going. We're, yeah, so I, I have no life. This is, this is all I'm doing today. Their works in progress. Uh, if y'all want to drop yours in, uh, in case people have to leave. Oh, oh yeah, it's great Every, to hear from y'all. Everyone's telling us to push it. <laughs> push it. <laughs> we're pushing it. It's happening. It's being okay, twenty-four okay. hours of live streaming our robots to see when they break. <laughs> oh yeah oh boy so, that would be a fun experiment <laughs> dexter we might do that later you're gonna hate me later but we're gonna do well that. maker I fair i've definitely been through eight hours at a maker fair yeah maker yeah. fair is a good test point so anyone who's trying to build their own robots if you pick an event that you want to be your test case and you don't mind having that like fear and meltdown that comes with bringing your prototype out <laughs> into the world uh, maker fair is a great place if you're going to have some local maker fairs after we all get back into visiting yeah. each other in real life. Um, Nova was for a party, which was about three or four hours. 
um, out at a bar <laughs> with the public and not with makers. And that was a really interesting way to test out her features. <laughs> um, let's see. For me, the first Maker Faire I went to was last year's in San Francisco with Alex. And that was such a learning experience because Aussie broke every day I was oh, out yeah. there. <laughs> every day was a new problem. Like even the day one, I was having issues, day two issues. It got to a point where at the end of the event, he was mostly hot glue and like bats, quickly soldered wires. <laughs> if you take your robot out to like a very long event, I recommend packing a hot glue gun, maybe a portable soldering iron and just small little things because there's a good chance it was gonna have an accident and you just wanna be prepared. Yeah, and just roll with it, it happens. <laughs> and you seem to really embrace this idea of like, test it, test it, test it until it breaks, then fix it better. And like, that's part of your workflow anyway. And so oh, when yeah. it happens in an event, it just seems like it's, you roll with it. Yeah, I'm literally, um, one of the best examples is, uh, I'll give you guys an example. Um, this morning, I'm working on another version of Dexter that I'm calling Mini Dex. Ooh, baby Dexter. Ooh. Little head right here already. He matches so your goggles. Smaller compared to normal Dexter's head. <laughs> He's got um, thing as well. Yeah, he has an iris eye as well. Iris. My main goal is to have another Dexter I can take with me out for just fun stuff. Like if I go out with my friends, like a museum or whatever, I want to have a little Dexter and I have to take big Dexter with me. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm designing him to actually have a camera in the iris eye. So he'll take a picture and then the iris eye will close. And of course, that's something I just that's so good. In a great because then I can see the world from his eyes, and then I can get like a whole like understanding of like, oh, this camera works this way, and like this is how they look. So if I like upgrade that for a future event, I can be like, oh, this is how they see from this point of view. Now if I add that with that, and science, science, science. But this morning, um, the reason like I was these guys saw me rushing in on here late is because I was spending hours trying to get the servos to work the way I want them to. <sighs> And it was a whole bunch of just trial and error this morning. Mm -hmm. And it gets to a point where, like, I will forget what time it is. Or, like, there has been times where I forgot what day it is. And I'm just like, crap, okay, it's like 2 a.m. And I have gotten nothing working. Okay. Take a step back. It's kind of like time to, time to take a break and sleep and let your sleeping brain work on it. Yeah. I haven't got these servos working yet, but I'm excited for them because I think it allowed a ton of personality. Yes, yeah, like all these like, really exciting, like, add-ons to it. I know this isn't on any of the lists, but I'm curious about power supplies. So I have this giant battery. And uh, for Fenrir, one of the new things that I did was uh, use these, I think they're called XT60 connectors, where they make it a lot easier to swap out different power sources. Yeah, here we go. So you um, hook one of these guys up to whatever you're powering. They have male and female sides, so you can easily tell uh, you know, which, which type of cable it is and um, they're polar. So, you know, you can only plug it in one way, so you can't plug it in backwards. And this way, so inside, that goes inside of here, hooked up to the Raspberry Pi. And then I have a USB cable that I can use to plug into here. And then I can swap it out with a wall wart that gives four amps and will like, you know, never run out of juice if I'm testing it on my desk or whatever. Mm -hmm. or, because I want him to like sit on my computer sometimes and look at me. Um, so yeah, what about y'all? Because you know, power is a huge thing when you're trying to uh, run something like this all day. Angela, you wanna go first? <laughs> um, I had to deal with the power issue with my costume that Nova goes with, um, mm. where uh, it was in a dress, it was on my body. I had like five meters of LED strips <gasps> and um, I ended up making like a thigh holster for my battery packs. Um, and they were big battery packs like you have, Alex. Um, that's a, a harder challenge with a little tiny bot like this. Um, and since she doesn't really have a lot going on here right now, she doesn't like draw a lot of power. Um, I'm actually using these little slim Ooh. phone charger. These are really nice. Um, let's see what they're at. Uh, Is that an anchor? They're about an amp. Um, so they do they do the job for this. Um, they're just a, they're actually a something Sparkfun used to carry, and I bought up as many as I could get uh, at the time. You find and a good really battery nice. pack. Yeah, um, they are good for cosplay too. And then I made a little pocket, and like you could see how slim that is. Um, but yeah, once I add more features, it's going to be like, where am I going to put a pack? Or maybe it's just that your runtime is reduced uh, for I some of these you. events, and then Dexter's got all that. 
Dexter is using power booster lithium ion batteries, and this is where he charges in. He has three lithium ion batteries inside of him, and they all can be charged through his butt. So <laughs> that's super cool. Like you can easily just take them and then like plug them up with a basic uh, mini USB charger, basically a cell phone charger, and then charge up the batteries and then keep going. Those sockets I notice you use all over are so, uh, they use, use them in the elbows and the wrists and stuff and also in the tail. Is that something you designed? Did you like find it somewhere? I found them originally on um, Thingiverse, but then I just kept editing them to a point where they just became my own thing. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm pretty well taught myself in Fusion. So I ended up going to Fusion a lot. And then after I've gotten to a certain level, I can just go in and like edit things now. So I spent a lot of time in Fusion. Now I think about it. It's probably, Me too. <laughs> well, it's probably the main one. For both of these, actually, for 3D modeling and for designing stuff for, for lasering. But I like this idea that you can have like a standard joint. that Now that's your joint that you use for robots and stuff. And you can modify it and whatever. But like when you need a joint, you know what to go for. And the same thing with your irises. Uh, like you have this thing that's in your goggles and it's in your little robot and stuff. And like, are there any other like... I don't know. I'm trying to like use these GoPro connectors as standardized across my robots because I can like easily retilt him or like swap out a different servo mount or whatever. Um, handle it. Yeah, do you have any like... It's definitely one of those things where like the more you do, the more you learn type of situation. Yeah. Like the idea of the ball bearings and stuff like that for his move, uh, for his arms and joints. I got the idea from um, puppeteering. Like if you've seen like, you know, stop motion animation, they have like their like basic uh, body model, and then you know they mold around it, and they're decent enough for them to just move. So I was just like, "Hey, that yeah, worked for me. Let me just see if I can take that and 3D print it." And it comes with ups and downs too, as well, because like it fits and it holds, which is really nice. But the problem Ooh. is, it's still pretty loose. So there's issues with that. And then like with the iris eye, like once I got one working, I was able to like instantly like make it smaller like i'm gonna quickly unscrew this really quickly because use screws guys not glue if you can afford it mm. <laughs> <laughs> totally uh, agree but yeah like i can like now do the same with his eye here that mm. closed and opens but the same thing with my goggles the same type of uh simple science just redesigning for a different size that's so cool and it doesn't um if you 3D printed all the parts, I would expect that changing the size would mean that it was affected by more by the resolution of the printing. Do you find that, that you had to do any extra filing or whatever or sanding? Yeah, I have to do a lot of like, depending on what it is and how badly I like want it, it kind of depends on how much work I put into it. Um, a good example is like since uh, Mini Dexter right now, I'm working on the prototype. So if you look at his like stomach and stuff, like it has all these really bad details like here and stuff like that from the printer. But I don't care because it's a prototype. It's not supposed to be perfect. It's a prototype. Mm, it'll be perfect later. Uh, <laughs> so when that happens, I'm just fine with it. But like Dexter's head here is like really smooth and just like nice. And that's because like I printed out a high quality and then also have this other, um, oh, what's it ah, here it is. I have some of this XT3D, which is like a mm -hmm. uh, chemical you can pour on your prints and then just clear it up. And then I also use a um, 3D print pen as well. Huh. Um, I've learned to use this as a welding tool, believe it or not. Huh. So if two parts are like both 3D printed, um, I can actually use this and kind of like weld them together and then like kind of chip it off and stand it down and smooth it out a little bit. That's and brilliant. Works. <laughs> I've seen Sophie Wong do some similar stuff with mm -hmm. that uh, for her dress. That's so cool. But yeah, um, let's see. What's some of your qu are these questions we got down here going? Uh, yeah. I think Mohib had a good one in the Q and A tab, which I totally didn't see until oh, just now. Oh, we have a Q and A uh, tab. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> um, have your companion bots had had behavioral issues in the past, and oh. what parenting techniques worked or didn't work? Uh, yes, the growing pains of creating mm. a robot child. <laughs> okay. At least for me, my biggest problem with my robots is that they tend to slap me. <laughs> and that's not really what I want. Like, my spider robot, Ossie, originally used to poke me in the face before I took out that servo. And this Dexter, with his hand being able to wave, and I was working on that, there were times where, like, the sensor was too fast, and I wouldn't be moving fast enough, and it would just slap me. It would just... <laughs> 
and then it'd be like looking happy too. So it's kind of like a little bit like, should I be mad right now? This is what, this is what parenting feels like. <laughs> but yeah, like, I, that, it gets really bad. What about you guys? I had a similar thing you can see. I mean, I have, I've been face on here, but like you could see, I'm going to turn so you can see a little bit of what Nova's doing right here. Um, for her to be perched on my shoulder and for her wings to flap open, I did a lot of testing with like what that range was on her wings without hitting me in the face, the right angle so that she would, her wings would go behind my hair. Luckily, I don't have a lot of hair on this side, so that was why I chose this shoulder for her. Um, and yeah, you got to test it because getting um, your hair tangled up inside of that little um, servo arm that I have here is really not comfortable. <laughs> it's painful. And you can get caught, yeah. Um, and then um, another thing that Nova has done, which I mentioned earlier, was that her head tilt was a little bit too wild and like getting her head to stay on at the right angle took a lot of like coaxing. And I, and I don't know about the two of you, I imagine this is, is true for you. Um, I talk to my bot a lot, even when she's not uh, completely put together. I'm like, don't you want to do this then. for me? Yeah. Don't you want to flap real nice and light up real nice right now? So I think there's, there becomes this dialogue with your creation. Uh, that's really interesting with robots. I, if you don't talk to your robot, I feel like there's something wrong with you. Like, I talk to Dexter all the time. Like, yeah, I think that's <laughs> maybe he's not even of... on. And I'm just chatting to him. Maybe you're the same type of people who tend to anthropomorphize everything or like personify everything. And so like, maybe that's partly why we're drawn to this. Cause like we can see their personalities in there. Um, my person, my personal philosophy is that if it has a name, you care about it. That's why everybody has a name. And I name everything. So <laughs> like my bike has a name. <laughs> uh, Archimedes, I had some parenting issues with, but unlike with children, I was able to do things about it, such as his, his eyebrows used to stab me in the face and uh, right, right at eye level. And so I would just like cut them off. You can just cut them off when it's like a rubber and not a child. <laughs> not with your children. And um, part of the reason that I completely rebuilt him as well is because the servos would just decide that they were done and be like, nope, today I will not. I am just going to lay here and do nothing. And so I was like, well, you will be replaced. It is fine. <laughs> That's something you should also think about people if, um, if you're trying to get more information about this. Think about how you can always get to the parts inside your robot because there are going to be times where something just breaks. Oh, yeah. And something that I've learned, that's why I have is uh, batteries being able to be plugged up in the back here. Um, I used to have to take Dexter fully apart to change his batteries. Like, I would have to like take off his full back panel just to change that. So definitely, yeah, design for maintenance. Really, design for maintenance. Remember that also like have to come stability. Off. So like yeah. these power connectors, it's got you know a soldered connection and then it's got a big piece of heat shrink and then I put hot glue inside the heat shrink and that like heats it up and shrinks it down but also sort of like fills that joint and structurally stabilizes it and that like makes a really solid connection for the connector and I'm sure there's like more professional ways to do that but that's like where I'm at right now is just like you know reinforce and like build things that are durable I'm always thinking about durability because like okay. the amount of times that I've Speaking of disciplining your your robot, he knows that if he breaks, he goes in the box. He's been in the box lots of times, and uh, so I'm constantly trying to like figure out ways to make him break less. That's cool. Hey, it works. Yeah, this kind of brings far. in a thing. Yeah, where we're going to talk about um, the modular factor, which kind of goes along with the design yeah. for maintenance, but is slightly different, more modular for fun and not for fixing. Um, Jay and I had a good discussion about this the other day. Um, and what I've been doing with Nova is um, I, she's actually one big slip cover, like all her fur is her skin that I can bring um, back and Velcro's in to get to the hardware. Mm -hmm. And that opens up this idea that she could have different outfits or looks um, based on what I felt like doing that day. If I wanted to go for like a cyberpunk goth look or something. Ah! She's a little too glam for that right now, but I could take off her little slip cover of fur and put on a different one. Um, and all the hardware is kind of contained in one little unit. And then it's very modular, which has been really oh, yeah. fun to experiment with. Um, 
and was just out of necessity at first, but then it's like, oh, I have so many more design opportunities now with this creature. And the motions might be the same, but as soon as you put a different look on it, they become a different personality. Totally. Can you show us her spare face again? Yes, she's got a spare face. This was um, before we started to, to go live. Um, so when I was building her, I didn't really know. I was kind of like designing her. I didn't have a sketch in mind. Um, and I started to sculpt. So here is her other face. I'm lucky. There you go. Um, so I made these two faces and then kind of took a Twitter poll to see which one looked the best or felt the best. And this one's definitely more of kind of a traditional dragon face. And this is more of like a bird and I end up going with that. But I could just swap this one on. Uh, and then she could she could wear a mask right now. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately customizable. Um, yeah, and I could print the wings in a different um, filament or do a different pattern on these. Um, right now they're little stars mm -hmm. with the edge lighting, but she could be a totally different style, which is really fun. Yeah, I, I remember, yeah, we were, we were talking about, we we're thinking of uh, aesthetics, like your robot mm -hmm. aesthetics you end up giving your, um, your robot, depending on like the person you are. And that's one thing I love to see because I have seen some other people make their own robots and I just love seeing the type of character they give because I come from an art background, so I follow the concept of picture telling a whole bunch of stories. Mm. So I often, especially with this new Dexter, I often think about like what I can add to tell a story. So when I redesign him, I start going through this giant like obsession of space stuff because I think I'm just tired of the earth. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to give him a very like NASA feel. So that's why I added, you know, more orange colors and like pale white colors because those are very like bright nasa -y colors. So story time. No. Yeah. <laughs> There is a question on our list about getting past the design hurdle. I'm curious what you would say about that. Uh, I think partly it is iteration. Like you were saying, Angela, with being able to like swap out different looks and things. I think a lot of it, like I, ca I start with a piece of paper that has like a drawing of what I want, but then during the process of building it, I think this also comes from us being like artists and not necessarily trained engineers. Like we don't, have a drawing and spec it out and then we make that thing you know we, it changes as you build it and um so often if i'm stuck on the design what helps most is to just start building it yeah i sketch out a lot of my stuff before and after the fact like there's times where i just get so excited that i just jump into like a 3d um cad processing but since nothing ever works the first time I do anything, I always have to take a break and then I, like, I'll take out my sketchbook and be like, okay, this didn't work because of this and this and this. Maybe if I move this here and this there. Like I, I plan to get a scanner one day and just scan like half of my sketchbook to show people. Cause apparently yeah. like a lot of people love to see that part of the process. So that's definitely something I'm going to try my best to show more for everyone. Um, here's a question that I suck with, um, documenting. Yeah, I'm going to give it to Alex on this one because, yeah. It might be the least useful to hear from me because it's something that I've done for so long, kind of automatic. Okay, well, here's here's the thing. I got started in documentation because uh, in 2009, I was getting into the hackerspace. I was trying to make a project a week and I wanted to remember the things I was learning and how to do them because otherwise I would just forget. And so there were notes to myself and I decided, oh, I might as well put these on the internet so that other people can see them too. And so really, it, I'm just teaching my future self what I've already <laughs> forgotten, like I'm sure I'm going to. And that's, so now it's, you know, it's my job basically, but that's still what I do. I keep these massive text files while I'm working on something with all the little like errors I come up with, all the little commands I'm running so I can test stuff. And like, that's what becomes the tutorial. It's really just sort of part of my process mm -hmm. is, because um, also I'll have, I'm not the kind of person who makes one project <laughs> in like a few weeks and then like finishes it and publishes it and does another thing. I always have like 25 projects running mm -hmm. and like I'll get blocked on something. I'll come back to it after like a few months when I'm like, oh, this tool will solve my problem with that. And it could be like weeks, months, years even. And so I partly take copious notes in order to, you know, so that I can come back and uh, pick it up again and actually finish it. So that's where a lot of my process comes from is just like notes to myself. Uh, I kind of suck at documenting. Actually, no, Angela, you're next because I'm going to be the last <laughs> one on this one. <laughs> I'm going to be the last. Well, Angela, your turn. Uh, to teach people is if it's hard, like, and you, and you know how you 
learn anyway sorry <laughs> uh, so i'm like alex and i used to document things professionally <laughs> so um i kind of worked through that workflow um but what i do is i take a lot of pictures i have a huge album of pictures that i'm trying to get up on my documentation page for Nova right now of just like anytime I change anything, take a picture, file it away in case it completely breaks and I need to reference it again. But also if you're going to write up a project page, it helps to see all that the dead ends and the different directions that your project went in, uh, especially if you want to show somebody else how to do it. A lot of us kind of have this imposter syndrome that uh, makers come up with this beautifully finished product out of nowhere and it was like straight from start to finish and nobody experiences that. Um, you kind of have to go through the pain of all the dead ends. So having that um, for your project helps you share out your process a little better than just saying, here's step-by-step step how to replicate this project. Um, it's a good talking point when you're um, doing a discussion like this when you're teaching somebody else. It's like, yeah, I tried that and I found it didn't work, but it was still important and valuable to the process. Uh, David said, uh, Jay, I feel like you inadvertently document your progress on T Twitter. Twitter's probably. Good for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm bad with documentation somewhat because I get into such a, a groove where I will forget to write things down or take pictures of it. And I would just have it done. And one thing, at least my favorite documentations and my favorite online tutorials are people who show step by step procedures. So I always try to judge myself from that and I always try to. Unless it's something like I really don't care much for, I always try to give the best, most informed information I can. Cause I always just imagine that I'm teaching like somebody else or I'm giving back to the community. So I want to give as much material and documentation, schematics, everything you need to reproduce this if you want, or even use like some of my designs or even just the circuit to build what you want to build. Um, but it's just, for me, it's the time of sitting down and typing that because I admit, to me, the most boring part of making is documenting. <laughs> I jump into a project and now we're just running with it. Like I built these goggles in like two days of me just playing around and then they got really popular. And yeah, yes, I know Dexter, you're judging me. Yeah, I know, you go whatever. You're, you're documented halfway now. Mm -hmm. But like having to stop and then being like, all right, today I'm just going to type up the story and type up all the instructions I need. And I'm bad with the grammar. English is not my first language mm -hmm. at all. Martian. So it's just, documenting is, is necessary, but just not my, my cup of tea. I, I, I need a minion to do it for me. Maybe to call myself and just have them document it for me. Yeah, I mean, I think there are two schools of it, right? There's, uh, for me, there's sort of a story version. Like I was doing this and then I had this problem. And so I figured out how to solve it via this. And that is sort of like, I think really helpful because you can see where the stumbling blocks are and how to push through those and also see that like, it's not a perfect process and we're not like amazing magical people who can do all this stuff on the first try. But also there's the other side where it's like, you know, uh, if someone wants just to come along and build a thing, you know, how would you tell them how to do it? And on Hackster, we have this, like, how long would it take someone to build the project? And that's never based on how long it took me. It's based on, like, <laughs> if someone had this entire, you know, tutorial, how could they do it? Or how long would it take them? And it's very different. Someone asked me how I keep and organize my notes. A blo notebook, blog, wiki? And the answer is yes. And random pieces of paper and notebooks and all this other stuff. Like, I'm, it, it's a whirlwind. And so I have, like, photos on my Speaking phone, like, Angela. <laughs> yeah, I use Twitter and Instagram like Jay, though less so in the last few months, I feel, just because, like, I don't know, somehow. Uh, but yeah, all of that. <laughs> and then you just got to kind of, like, try and smush it all together into one page. I don't know. Yeah, let's see. Uh, tinkering as a coping mecha mechanism. We're just going down to talking points at this point. Yes. So we've all been doing a little bit of that. Um, <laughs> I think even the viewers here, we're, that's why we're all doing a makeup fair, right? Um, yeah. Just to get back to that, uh, talking about something else and putting your energy into something um, creative and uh, compelling. Uh, that's what's been so nice about making these bots. For me, um, I'm getting a little jealous of all of the video chats I have with my coworkers and their dog or their cat walks in. It's like, oh, it's just my pets. And it's like, I don't have a pet right now. So I'm like, oh, it's just my robot. It's just my robot <laughs> hanging out. Um, but it's a comforting thing to like, 
have this little familiar that uh, you're creating and that you're nurturing while you're building it, right? Or nurturing these creatures. Uh, and that's a really good feeling. So that's how I'm coping. I'm nurturing my, my bot. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've always tinkered as a coping mechanism for like life in general. So this just gave me more time to do a lot more. Like there's no way I would have built Dexter here if I had to go to work every day. <laughs> like that would have been. So like I love it because it just gives me more of a reason to like wake up and then like start tinkering. Like there are times where I've actually fallen asleep at my desk and I'm just like have my head down and, just, and I wake up and I'm just like, oh, right. I was printing something. Let me just get back to that. And it's a weird coping mechanism, but like, it's such a, in my opinion, it's such a productive one because like, I am constantly learning, I'm constantly doing something. And I feel like being able, I think I've been posting more on Twitter this past like thing with my own um, projects is because I get to share it with people and then I get feedback, which makes me feel like a lot better. Like, hey, I'm not really alone in my room. People see my work and they like it, keep going. You know, this amazing like, influx of people being able to just give me a pat on the back for what I'm doing just feels amazing. You know, I kind of wonder if that's partly why I've petered off of sharing stuff on social media because I find that I have less and less tolerance for people coming in and telling me how to do the project when I'm in the middle of it. And so I'm like, I'm just going to share it when it's done. So no one is going to be like, you should do it this way. And I'm like, I'm going to have to like rage about it or whatever. Like, I know that a lot of people are like, really, you know, they mean it in a good way, but sometimes it feels like patronizing or like, I haven't thought about that or whatever. I, like, I, yeah, I've heard that thing, but like this thing and that thing. And it is, you know, maybe I just need to share those things because there are things that I've tried and stuff, but like, okay, I have this thing called the glow up, right? Which is like, it shines blue light in your eyes. Yeah, I saw that. To help, like it's scientifically safe and healthful and good for you in some ways, but every time I post it, people are like, it's bad for you. She's being so irresponsible. And I'm like, no, just read the tutorial. <laughs> like, but um, we were talking about it as a co co coping mechanism. And I think it's very true. I went on a walk, like I'm lucky to live with a few people, which it makes me very happy. But like, I went on a walk and I like saw a bee. And I like saw another bee and I was like, oh, it's so nice. Like I was trying to interact with the bees because I was like, oh, <laughs> friends and like they didn't want to be my friends but <laughs> I do want to have animal friends it would make my life nicer and so that's probably why I've designed this guy so that he can um he's going to be able to hook onto my computer monitor as well and like look at me that way I don't have to like wear him all day in order to interact and I think you know Dexter is going to be able to sit Nova can like hang out on a flat surface I'm sure but like you know having different ways so that like even without this sort of like bodily restriction um i can just have a companion around that i can just like you know be i mean you can also learn how to seem like a disney princess and then all the animals just come straight out of nowhere <laughs> oh, totally. straight for you they can clean up your house they hang out with you and stuff you know somebody right. tell me how to make friends with bees i think it's just like coat yourself in sugar <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, let's get through these last questions and then we'll end the stream um ups and downs emotional points of building a project. So as a person who runs on a failure, yes, that's me. Um, I Ups and downs for me, the hardest down is when I'm printing something, let's say I took hours designing like Dexter's faceplate, and then let's say it's like a 15 hour print on my Creality CR10. Whew. My most down point is like, okay, I'm printing it. It looks fine. I waited a few hours and like babysat it. And I'm like, okay, cool. It's good. I'm going to go off and like go to work or go to the store and do something else. But then when I come back and then something happened where it's failed and I'm just like, hmm, I just feel like several hours of just like work is just wasted. So it's just like those, that's my biggest down. I can really say that's like the most like, frustrating I have when it comes to making and tinkering and stuff is just when my prints fail. Mm -hmm. But um, it's also, of course, you know, a lot of things can go into that. Joel does a very good time uh, telling people like what could be go wrong with doing your printers or doing your prints. It could be the file, it could be the printer, all these different things. But I will end up with an up. Um, one of my favorite ups is when the robot moves for the first time when mm -hmm. I want it to move. Like, it's such a reaction. It's just like, it's alive. It's alive. <laughs> totally. <laughs> uh, what about you guys? 
Uh, I could talk a little bit about ups and downs. This is actually the whole um, kind of point of my talk at Supercon. It was about a project, but it was actually about the emotional journey uh, mm -hmm. for the fairy project that I built. Um, and I'm one of those makers who uh, has this tendency to make a big idea for a very short deadline and a very specific event. And it's really high stakes, which gets you motivated, but also can create this complete stress wall that you have to like hit every time you're making progress. You're like, well, I did this thing. Oh, look, I made the wings move, but like I have 17 other things on my list that I'm not doing. And it's really a constant battle to like balance yourself as you're making to step back and see the joy of why you're doing it. It's like, yeah, this event would be nice, but why am I really doing it? It's because I want a little friend. It's because I want this thing that's going to bring joy to me and to the people who are interacting with it. Um, so a lot of the, the downs for me with Nova was like the constraints that I had set on myself and then having a conversation with myself. It's like no one else expects anything of this. I'm the one who's expecting and I can be kind to myself when I'm frustrated and take a break, walk away, and she'll still be here uh, when I come back and when I feel better about it. Uh, she's starting to do a little tipsy thing right here too. But she's been working her way. <laughs> uh, what about you, Alex? Yeah, I guess uh, same. I've definitely um, over the years come to realize that I do do a lot of stuff last minute and I should stop beating myself up over the way that I work um, because I would, you know, it would be a few days before and I'd be like, why haven't I done this? Why aren't I doing it now? Why am I on Twitter right now instead of building? And it's like, that's just how my brain works. And it's always okay. And this idea of having multiple levels of acceptability, like you were saying, Angela, where you, you know, you have this whole list of like 18 more things that you want to do. And it's like, you know what, his ears aren't moving. And I, you know, I could do an AI demo right now, but like, that's not really interesting for the camera. And, but that's okay. He's like, he's got a head. He's like there on my shoulder. Like that's an acceptable level. And I think it's still cool to share. I think also I see those 18 steps like ahead of me and I just get tired. Mm -hmm. Like it feels like it's such a slog ahead. And to deal with that, I sort of sink into like remembering how much I love the process. I do this stuff because I love just the process of making things. And I have to just remember that, like get less fixated on the end goal and more fixated on just like enjoying what I'm doing at the time, which is like cutting and laser cutting and stuff, which I legitimately love. And um, I guess none of those things are like familiar specific, but yeah, uh, <laughs> the, the payoff is definitely great. I think the biggest payoff for me is when I run across uh, children and drunk people because yes. they have, <laughs> they're both the best audience and they're just like, they have no boundaries. They have no self-consciousness. They'll just be like, what's that? And they like want to play with it and like interact with it and like, you know, and get up in your face and be like, oh, let me ah. and you're like, yeah. And it, you made a thing that, that like this person is fascinated by and delighted with. And it's just, it's, it's such a good Great. vibe. Great. Yeah. All right. Last question. And then well, I guess we'll sign off. Um, we'll just go with the next steps. What's next for everybody? Whew. All right. Uh, um, who wants to go first? <laughs> yeah, I saw a tweet by Leeborg today, uh, Lee Cyborg, who was talking about um, how they've done these origami things. And I think it'd be really cool to make an origami style robot. Mm. Part of the deal with the laser cut pieces and making stuff out of cardboard is that I want to make things more accessible to people who like are kids or whatever and can't use a 3D printer or a laser cutter or don't have access to one. Um, anyone like that, like I, there's this thing, Papercraft, Papakura, that you can uh, turn 3D models into printable, like things that you would cut out and fold and glue or whatever. And I think that like that melded with the idea of the base robot um, template idea would be really cool because you could have like, you know, your sort of robot base and you can put different things on top of it. Kind of like the auto robot actually already has. And, um, or this Moo Moonbot robot. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a couple that are like that. And some of them have like little swappable stickers. I think that'd be really cool. But yeah, all kinds of stuff. Oh, too many ideas. 
<laughs> what about you? Uh, what about you, Angela? Uh, what's next for Nova? Well, this is Nova's first uh, version, which I'm really happy that she turned out as well as she did. It was yeah. a race to the finish. Um, I think for her, I would like to get some more of that um, interactivity in there. She only really has one behavior right now. It's like hang out and like get a little scritch. Uh, so trying to think of other moods that she might have would be really compelling. Uh, it'll add to her personality. Um, and hopefully I can just do that without completely redesigning her. So doing those little stages of improvements as a really nice workflow. It's like you don't feel like you're starting over yeah. with your project. It's like, I want to try this. And if it doesn't work, I still have the base functionality still there for next time I make an attempt. So yeah, I'm just going to tinker a little bit with her personality. Definitely an add on. Don't, you know, <laughs> mess up with that. Uh, for me, of course, I already talked about mini decks and his ability to take pictures and like look around when we hang out and stuff like that. But for uh, my lovely decks here, I want to, he's already more interactive than he used to be because now he can actually do this stuff and interact with people. But I do want to add um, some more interactivity for him. Uh, maybe something like a uh, Google Assistant type of thing where people could talk to him and just like, Maybe drunk people will ask some questions or something, or even kids <laughs> ask some questions. He could just use Google to be like, oh yeah, this is just the thing. Just more, more differently interactivity. And I um, mentioned like his waving arm is actually removable. Like I designed it differently for that reason. Um, later, because I have two nephews, I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old who like Nerf guns. So I plan to take one of his arms and turn it into a Nerf gun shooter. And then I'm just going to just let it happen. Just going to let the rest happen. <laughs> I'm not weaponizing him. I am preparing him for children. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, it's been pretty much an hour. Nova's uh, done. She is done. <laughs> she's done. Oh, no. <laughs> Working right now. Hey, so, that's an know. hour on camera. <laughs> See, now you have a time frame. I've had to keep really good posture while holding, like, because, like, if I slouch, then this happens and stuff. Yeah, they move around a lot. Not anymore. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, I think we had a question in the chat earlier if we were um, going to post this recording. I think, Alex, you're, you've been recording. Totally. Stream, yeah. And we're going to edit down uh, and try and post it somewhere, and we'll share out the link. There's no promises on the editing down. Uh, editing we'll edit out the like... first part where we're just chatting oh, totally, uh, about yeah. technical stuff. <laughs> we'll out the, the pre-show chatter. Even though that was great, it's uh, not going in the recording, and we'll put it out somewhere. Um, where should I share that, just so that everybody knows? I'll put it on Twitter. I'll send it to you. Yeah, folks. I think when yeah. people registered, did they give? Did they put in an email? Maybe we could email a follow up with that link to some people. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I will find out. We will get it on the internet somehow. We will. And you. if all else fails, you should already you should already be following all of us on the social media. But if you're not, oh, are we doing like <laughs> a final? final I mean, we can. And odd day and glow ass. Oh yeah. Some of us can do Bye. a little. Bye everybody. Bye everybody. Bye, everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us. Oh ciao.